Vantage, an evocative name for a magnificent bloodline of thoroughbred sports cars. For seven decades, the heartbeat of Aston Martin's purest models, the Vantage nameplate has been worn by some of its most memorable designs, and this is another of them, now enhanced with a Roadster convertible version and a more powerful F1 edition variant. If you think you know what an Aston is and can be, and you haven't tried this Vantage, then you might need to think again. As with the brand's other models, you might still buy it because of the way it looks, or because it makes you feel like James Bond. We think, though, that you'll simply want one because it's a very, very good sports car. If you can't afford that top-end exotic supercar, Aston Martin's new generation Vantage could be the next best thing. In fact, it may even be better. And today, we're going to find out why. It was a time late in the last century when Aston Martin meant something very different. An iconic British brand to be sure, but a maker of hand-built sports cars aimed at older buyers. Romance by name and heritage in the face of compelling evidence that German and Italian rivals were better made and finer to drive. The gorgeous DB11 of 2016 was a sign that the future might be different, but it was still an old-style GT rather than an out-and-out -out sports car. The kind of design still most likely to appeal to old-school Aston enthusiasts. A slightly smaller model with a younger, more dynamic orientation was needed. A car that someone with little prior interest in the brand might buy. A car you could seriously choose over a top Porsche 911 or a Mercedes AMG GT. A car like this one, Aston Martin's new generation Vantage. For seven decades, the Vantage nameplate has been the heartbeat of some of Aston Martin's purest models and was first used in 1951 on a high output engine option for the DB2. The Vantage quickly became a model in its own right. History highlights, including the William Towns designed V8 Vantage of 1977 and a spectacular twin supercharged V600 Le Mans model. Most familiar in the heritage line for potential customers, though, will be the car this one replaced. The V8 Vantage first launched in 2005. That was the first modern era Aston to really catch the attention of the company's German and Italian rivals, being relatively light, fast on its feet and desirably styled in both its coupe and roadster guises. But both the V8 and V12 versions sounded faster than they actually were. Build quality was patchy and the old-fashioned VH chassis precluded the car from being able to match its competitors on track. Aston's never have been able to do that. Turn up to a track day in one and you'll be almost a celebrity. So rarely is the brand usually represented. But this car, first introduced in 2018, has proved to be different. Modelled unapologetically on a Porsche 911 and sharing its V8 twin turbo engine with a Mercedes AMG GT, it's willfully different from the brand's other models, not only in the way it looks, but also in the way it handles. It's the most serious driver's car the company's ever made. There are questions though. It's slightly heavier than its 911 arch rival, plus, being over 20% more expensive than the outgoing model, this car no longer has the significant price advantage over its immediate competitors that its predecessor enjoyed. And should we care that this engineering borrows so much from directly competing class contenders? All good questions, but in the years since its launch, this new era Vantage has been answering them more and more effectively as the range has expanded. First with a Roadster convertible version and then with an even more powerful F1 variant. As a result, the Vantage has proved to be a crucial car in transitioning Aston Martin from the past into a more profitable future. Today, we're going to find out why. You know this is a different kind of Aston from the moment you get into it. Everything's that bit more focused than in, say, a DB11. A feeling confirmed when you push the winged starter button in the centre of the dash and the snarly 4-litre twin-turbo V8 springs urgently into life. 
Aston always goes to a great deal of trouble to make its cars sound right, but we'd worried that in the switch from the previous model's normally aspirated engine to this replacement design's twin turbo unit, here it might be different. Well, we needn't have. Porsche has allowed emission regulations to somewhat stifle the oral excitement of its rival 911, but the British brand hasn't made that mistake here. Can this car, though, provide more than just orchestral fireworks? Well, let's find out. You'll want it to be fast, and this car needs to be in an era where a Porsche 911 Carrera S costing a third less is capable of getting to 62 miles an hour from rest in just 3.4 seconds. Even though it's got 60 PS more than that car, this Vantage can't quite match that kind of pace, mainly because it's about 10% heavier. For the same reason, it's also fractionally off the pace of the higher bracket super sports cars it now more directly competes with, contenders like the 911 Turbo and the Audi R8 V10. Does that matter? Not really, unless you really like your stats. The intoxicating soundtrack and the exhilarating roar under hard acceleration makes this car feel quite sufficiently supercar quick. In fact, the performance figures the 510 PS Mercedes AMG sourced V8 wouldn't have been out of place in a fully fledged supercar just a few years back. Thanks to a thumping 685 newton meters of torque developed from just 2,000 RPM, 62 miles an hour from rest can flash by in just 3.6 seconds if you're quick with the deliciously tactile aluminium gear shift paddles. And for the brave or foolhardy owners who've a runway, a racetrack or a de-restricted autobahn to hand, maximum velocity is reached at 195 miles an hour. But even these stats don't really communicate how very, very fast this Vantage feels once you're in the sweet spot of its rev range. Quick, in a way, its V8 Vantage predecessor never was. Bury your brogues into the carpet and you'll find that this car needs less than five seconds to get from 30 to 70 miles an hour in fourth gear with seamless mid-range pulling power that's untroubled by any kind of turbo lag. All of which makes you wonder why every 21st century Aston model prior to this one was so wedded to normal aspiration. With this V8, the location of its twin single scroll turbo so close to the cylinder head in the 90 degree V between the engine blocks helps greatly in this regard. A design originally pioneered by Ferrari Formula One engines. You'll obviously need full mastery of the various driving modes to experience all that this Vantage has to offer. There are three activated by this S button on the right-hand steering wheel spoke. As usual, with these kinds of setups, the various settings alter steering feel, throttle response, stability control thresholds, and the change times of the ZF 8-speed auto gearbox that Aston prefers to the dual-clutch Merc transmission that's normally mated to this 4-litre V8. Sport is the most comfort orientated option. Next up is Sport Plus, which deepens the engine note and adds red trimming to the centre of the digital rev dial. Finally, there's Track, which sends everything into red mist mode, but which is best reserved for circuit use. There's no cruisy GT option like you get in a DB11, but as on that car, the standard Skyhook adaptive damping is separated off into its own system with Sport, Sport Plus, and Track track settings accessible through this left-hand steering wheel button. Which is where we could leave things if this were any Aston, but it isn't. The brand's never taken on the industry's biggest sports car contenders head-to-head -head in terms of drive dynamics. It's cars making up for what they lacked in this department with style, sound and a 007 blend of savoir-faire. This one doesn't need to do that. It meets what might just be the industry's most demanding dynamic brief, that for handling capability to take on and match that of the all-conquering Porsche 911. Which is a mantra that applies whether you choose this standard model, the alternative Roadster convertible with the same engine, the alternative F1 edition coupe or Roadster variants with power uprated to 535 PS or even the rare and long sold out V12 Vantage Coupe which had a fearsome 710 PS at its disposal. Here though we're going to concentrate on the version most will choose, the standard 510 PS V8 Vantage Coupe. Let's be clear. 
This is nothing like any Aston we've tested before in the way it changes direction and sides from bend to bend. And of course, there's more than one reason why. Former chief development engineer Matt Becker gave much of the credit to the addition of a feature never previously used by the brand, an electronic rear differential, or EDIF. Linked to the Vantage's electronic stability control system and the dynamic torque vectoring setup, this can understand the car's behaviour and react accordingly to direct the engine's power to the relevant wheel. At which point various factors come into play. The tremendous traction of the bespoke Pirelli P0 tyres, the perfect 50-50 weight distribution, the vast improvement in the body's torsional stiffness, up from 8,000 newton meters per degree in the old Vantage to 35,000 newton meters per degree this time. And the huge increase in downforce that the new aerodynamics now generate, 77 kilos on the rear at top speed. The steering's great too, perhaps not quite as feelsome as it is in that rival Porsche, but good enough to immerse you totally as an integral part of the action, which, given the need to switch from a hydraulic to an electric setup this time round, is another notable achievement. Becker and his team used that 911 as a benchmark here, as in virtually every aspect of this car's dynamic development. He'll tell you, for instance, about how this Vantage's bigger master braking cylinder is modelled on that in the Porsche. Hence, a level of retardation of different order to anything else we've previously experienced in an Aston, even before you start thinking about the optional ceramic brakes. Which is important given that this is built as the first Aston you'd really want to take on a race circuit. Hence, of course, the track mode and the provided option for the very skilled, the very brave, or the very stupid of completely turning off all the stability systems. Own this car and it would be criminal not to even at least try a track day in it. Though the cost in burned Pirelli rubber as you experience the considerable lateral G this Vantage can hold through fast sweepers would no doubt be significant. Of course, in creating the car this way, Aston's made it less effective at the things an Aston is usually very good at, wafting you long distances at very high speeds and leaving you fresh and almost rejuvenated at the end of it. Keep the Skyhook adaptive dampers in sport and the Vantage's ride actually isn't bad at all. It's a far better commuting tool, but it can't deliver the dual faceted personality of a 911 in being as good picking up your dry cleaning as it is on a track. No super sports car is. We don't really see that as a problem here. Aston has got close enough and will no doubt further its offering in the future. As for the whole GT thing, well, if you want to cruise about in a, a Bond style super sports car, you'd buy a DB11, wouldn't you? There are Vantage issues, but they're not that significant. There's a little more road noise than we'd like at highway speeds, and the extra width of this new era design, combined with the lower driving position, can make the car feel quite wide on narrower country roads. You might be disappointed to find that you can't manually change the note of the sports exhaust as you can in its rivals. And it's worth mentioning that the ZF Auto gearbox isn't quite as eager to kick down as rival boxes in, say, a McLaren or a 911. We'd still have it, though, over the manual stick shift that Aston's also developed for this car. Whether the result of all of Aston Martin's efforts here is a better car than its rivals is a call you might enjoy making for yourself. Objectively, it might not be, but super sports cars aren't often bought objectively. Subjectively, the way this Vantage thunders about and brings its own charm to this sector is difficult to resist. It's desirable in a way that some of its competitors can't quite be. And for us, it's the best Aston ever made. It wasn't so long ago that every new Aston Martin rather resembled the last. Here, though, is one that truly does look different, breaking free of the styling stereotype that's characterised the company for the last couple of decades. Yes, the design fundamentals are similar. The long bonnet, front-mounted engine and cab rearward silhouette that's common to every Aston in living memory. 
But this time round, a more predatory, aggressive approach has been prioritised over the subtle elegance that characterised the previous model, a car that was also around 18mm shorter and narrower than this one. It was launched in 2018 in this coupe form. Talk to your dealer if you like the idea of a roadster version. For coupe and roadster customers, there's the alternative of a more powerful F1 edition version, recognisable by its larger 21-inch wheels, carbon fibre detailing, a unique veined grille design and a substantial aero package, including a bigger rear wing. This Vantage makes a statement, particularly here at the front end, which is dominated by the lowest sighted functioning grille ever to have been used on one of the company's cars, and surely also one of the largest. You'll either love or hate this feature, some think it's a little Lightning McQueen, but it certainly gives this car plenty of overtaking presence. Is it pretty? Don't ask, it isn't meant to be. But pretty purposeful? You'd better believe it. Who needs elegance? And you certainly won't get it if you fail to avoid a few of the midlife crisis paint shade options. On delivery, you won't be able to resist taking a quick look at what lies beneath the bonnet. The V8 engine is hand-built by a Mercedes craftsman in a Falterback, but the signature plate upon it references the sign-off in Gaiden. In profile, you're reminded again that this new era Vantage shares nothing but its name with its predecessor. It doesn't share much with its DB11 showroom stablemate either, apart from the all-aluminium chassis it rides upon. And even here, 70% of the structural components are different in this model. This is a more compact, wieldy sports car and looks it, being 274 millimetres shorter than that larger Aston, with a punchy, modern stance further emphasised by minimal front and rear overhangs, muscular flanks and broad haunches. Perhaps more pertinently, this car is 34mm shorter than a rival Porsche 911 and, as on that car, some of the details are really neat, like the hidden door window seals. Unlike on a DB11, you don't get options to change the look and colour of the upper part of the body, but you can, as here, specify a bespoke look for this side gill panel behind the front wheel arch, which can be finished in matte black, or as in this case, black carbon. The roof, the mirror caps, the window surrounds and the door handles are just a few of the other exterior areas that can also be ordered in a choice of finishes. And of course, you can choose between a range of unique design styles for the 20 inch wheels. With this car we've got black forged textured rims. Our favourite vantage point though is here at the rear which is dominated by this pencil thin LED lighting strip and this aggressively angled lower diffuser which helps to generate 50 kilos more downforce than the previous model could offer. That's vastly more than any previous Aston Martin has been able to deliver. The standard exhaust system has a couple of tailpipes. Here we've got the sports exhaust set up with its four snarling outlets. Of course, as usual, what's more important is what you can't see. The complex system of air channels beneath the car that suck it to the road. The massive 30% improvement in torsional rigidity over the previous model and the perfect 50-50 weight distribution. The designers have tried to keep the weight down by coating that sophisticated bonded platform in a mixture of aluminium and composite plastic panels. But the combination of that throaty Mercedes V8, a big ZF auto gearbox and the addition of an electronic diff lock together take their toll. This car weighs in around 20 kilos heavier than its predecessor and, depending on how it's specified, could be up to 160 kilos or more heavier than your rich neighbour's Porsche 911. OK, let's take a look inside. The key fob feels cheap and not everyone will like these little door pulls or the fact that the doors now open conventionally. With the previous Vantage, they swung gently upwards, supercar style, in a graceful swan wing. But there's much to like once inside. It's a cockpit that shrinks round you far more than it does in a DB11, as you might expect it might, given this Vantage's 101mm reduction in wheelbase. You sit 10mm lower than you did in the previous model, which helps with the immersive feel, and grasp a flat-bottomed, race-style, stitched wheel, complete with huge 
aluminium paddle shifters. Through it, you view a single dial instrument binnacle, the colours of which change depending on drive and suspension mode selections, made respectively via tabs on these right and left wheel spokes. As with the last model, there are still too many knobs and buttons scattered around the cockpit. We've counted well over 40, which gives a rather cluttered look on first acquaintance. But once you get used to where everything is, it's nice not to have to root around in an infotainment screen submenus to find what you want, as is the case with some rivals. Whether this is a cabin finished with the kind of quality you'd want when spending up to £150,000 or more could be debated. The interior of an Audi R8 or a Porsche 911 will certainly feel more upmarket. The cabin of a rival McLaren 540C, less so. Trimmed expensively like this with contrast blue stitching, a perforated leather headlining and the optional more supportive Sport Plus seats with headrest embroidery, the Vantage makes a suitably persuasive case in this company. But fail to spend for seduction and you won't get it. Still, that's also the case elsewhere in this segment. In Aston's larger DB11, attempts to provide this are slightly undermined by the rather obvious use of fixtures and fittings borrowed from the parts bin of engineering partner Mercedes. You get that here too, of course. Steering wheel stalks from an A-Class, anyone? But generally, the integration of shared items is far less obvious, the only exception being this borrowed centre dash infotainment display. It's unfortunately a generation behind current model Mercedes tech, which is why it's only 8 inches in size and doesn't have a touchscreen. But it works well enough by either voice command, one of these lower centre stack buttons, or this rotary dial between the seats, which you'll probably want to be fitted out with this optional touchpad. As you'd expect, a DAB audio system, navigation, Bluetooth audio streaming and Apple CarPlay smartphone mirroring all come included. It'll be irritating for those not of an Apple persuasion, though, that Android Auto doesn't. Many of the infotainment functions also replicate themselves onto an instrument binnacle display next to the central rev counter dial. This right-hand screen offering the usual selectable trip, nav, radio, media, telephone and service options. Thankfully, Aston has resisted the temptation to relocate all of the ventilation controls into the central fascia monitor. Though a press of this menu button does allow it to deal with climate functions. As usual with this British brand, your transmission options are separated out into little buttons on the centre console, which in this Vantage have been arranged in this triangular arrowhead formation. The combination of the high waistline and that low set seating position doesn't do much for all-round visibility, of course. The bonnet seems to go on forever. And as usual with super sports cars, rearward visibility is woeful. So the large door mirrors and the standard all-round parking sensors are welcome. It's easy to get comfortable, though, thanks both to the slight increase in cabin size this time round and the various support options delivered by the standard power-adjustable seats. These can, of course, be fitted with heating and cooling and come trimmed as standard with a combination of Alcantara and leather, though many will want the full hide finish we have here, which extends into these beautifully crafted footwell knee pads and saddle leather door pulls. Cabin stowage is at a bit of a premium. There's no glove box, nor do you get an overhead compartment for your sunglasses. This stitched lidded storage box between the seats, which sits behind a couple of cup holders, is also rather shallow and costs extra. The door bins are bigger than expected, though, and there's probably enough space behind the seats for shorter folk to insert a designer shopping bag without crushing it too much. Plus, of course, you can reach back to this boot shelf, which tries to compensate for the lack of the useful little rear pews you'd get in a DB11 or perhaps more pertinently in a rival Porsche 911. That 911 will give you boot space at both ends of the car. You don't get that here, but the 350 litre luggage area capacity is vastly better than you get from, say, a rival Audi R8. You're still going to have to pack with squashy bags rather than big suitcases, but there's enough room here to make transcontinental GT motoring a far more realistic option. A couple of carry-on cases and a soft bag would fit in here just fine. Aston even reckons you could get a couple of golf bags back here. They'd need to be pretty small ones. 
We like the two-tiered design of this luggage space too. We referenced the separate further shelf area behind the seats earlier, which allows coats and small items to be kept separate from bigger bags. You don't get any additional room below the boot floor, but there's a small recessed area below the boot lid with a tie-down strap next to the warning triangle. This further recessed area to the right is taken up with this zip-up bag containing the inevitable tyre inflation kit. A final neat touch lies with the optional inclusion of an umbrella on the inside of the tailgate. At the time of this updated test in summer 2022, this Vantage was priced at just over £131,000 in standard coupe auto form, about £10,000 more than it cost when we first tested it at launch. And at the time of this film, a standard Vantage Roadster was priced from £137,500. From launch, the alternative F1 edition version cost from £142,000 in coupe form. It's worth pointing out that this modern era model's 20% increase in power and asking price moves it up a subcategory when it comes to exotic super sports cars. With around 435 PS and a price tag of just over £100,000, the pre-2018 era Vantage competed with contenders like a base version of the Mercedes AMG GT. Today, with a starting output figure of 510 PS and a likely £135 to £150,000 on the road price, this new one tilts at cars like the McLaren GT. That's quite a difference. Think of it in Porsche 911 terms, and it's the difference between a 911 GTS and a 911 Turbo, which you might think to be ambitious, given that the new version of this Aston is 30 PS or more down on that faster 911 and lacks the 911 Turbo's four-wheel drive system. It's a similar story if your point of comparison is with an Audi R8, another super sports car pitched at around £130,000 in coupe form. But that V10-powered four-wheel drive Ingolstadt model has has an even greater 60 PS power advantage over this Vantage. Aston Martin buyers would argue this car's feeling of exclusivity and intoxicating soundtrack justify its market positioning. And they've got a point. Let's look at your options beyond a 911 or an R8. We've mentioned the Mercedes-AMG GT, which shares its 4-litre V8 engine with this car. For a direct comparison, you need the standard 527 PS GT version of that model, which at the time of this test would save you a not inconsiderable £23,000 over a Vantage. We've also mentioned the McLaren GT, which delivers 620 PS and has an appropriately exotic handcrafted feel but isn't built as well as the most comparable Vantage model, the F1 edition, and costs nearly £23,000 more than that F1 variant before you start adding extras. Maserati's MC20 is cut from similar cloth, but puts out 639 PS, and at the time of this test, cost around £187,000. There aren't really any other options that precisely fit the niche that Aston Martin's aiming at here. To think in terms of a BMW's M8 would be to think in terms of the lower-powered, slightly more affordable super sports car market sector this modern Vantage has left behind. A Mercedes-AMG SL63 is in the right pricing and power ballpark at £118,000 and 580PS, but isn't really exclusive enough. And to consider, say, a Bentley Continental GT would be to stray into territory that Aston more accurately targets with its larger DB11. If, having considered all of this, you conclude quite reasonably that there's nothing else quite like a Vantage at this price and power point in the super sports car market, then you're going to want to know just how generous Aston's been with the standard spec. So let's see. Standard kit includes full LED headlamps and tail lights, plus 20-inch silver Y-spoke wheels shod with bespoke Pirelli P0 tyres, and an adaptive damping system with the brand's Skyhook technology, and Sport, Sport Plus and Track driving modes. And, as you'd hope, there's an alarm and all-round parking sensors. 
Inside, you get eight-way electrically adjustable sports seats trimmed in leather and Alcantara. Plus, there's dual-zone climate control and an eight-inch centre-dash infotainment screen incorporating navigation, an Aston Martin DAB audio system and iPod and iPhone integration. We should also cover what you get with the alternative Vantage F1 edition model in both coupe and roadster forms. The extra £11,000 required for this more track orientated derivative gets you 25 PS more power, extra front chassis reinforcement, upgraded dampers, stiffer rear springs and a tweaked steering system offering greater feedback. Also included on the F1 version are larger 21-inch wheels, carbon fibre detailing, a unique veined grille design and a substantial aero package, including a bigger rear wing that boosts downforce by 200 kilos at high speed. Plus, you can have it in a special shade of racing green. Whatever Vantage variant you choose, at this price, it's annoying to have to pay extra for features like heated seats, floor mats, keyless entry and cruise control. And the touchpad for the infotainment system should be standard too. All these things are, of course, on the options list. Two of them, cruise control and the touchpad, come included as part of an extra cost tech pack, which also includes keyless entry, glass switches, a powered steering column, blind spot monitoring and an auto park assist system that steers you into spaces. You might want that. You're almost certain to want the uprated quad pipe sports exhaust system. Plus, probably also things like the Aston Martin premium audio system, ventilated seats, a 360 degree surround view camera and a tracking system. Usefully for track day warriors, carbon ceramic brakes, which can't be had on a DB11, are also optional. The more supportive Sports Plus seats we've been trying here come as part of a Sports Plus pack that also includes a sports steering wheel, in this case finished in obsidian black leather. You're probably also going to want the Comfort Pack, which gives you a closed stowage and armrest package, along with heated seats that feature increased 16-way powered adjustment. You might want to add a few luxury touches too, a smarter jewellery key for instance, maybe also the umbrella that fits in its own holder on the inside of the tailgate. Many Vantage owners treat themselves to a full leather interior too, some upgrading to softer Caithness or Balmoral hide. Practical extras include various bespoke car covers, a garage door opener, a first aid kit and the optional four-piece bespoke luggage set which makes the most of boot space and which can be ordered in leather or technical fabric. This set can, on request, be colour matched to the car. Otherwise, your options mainly cover aesthetic items. Aston Martin has its own bespoke Q service to help customers tailor their cars to their own specific wishes. But we're going to assume here that you'll be making a lot of the decisions yourself. That is, after all, part of the pleasure of buying such an exclusive sports car. We'll start outside. Here we've got one of the special optional Q special paint colours, Zafri Blue. A range of much wilder colours reside on the option list. Lime Essence, Yellow Tang, Hyper Red or Cinnabar Orange, anyone? But you might want to think twice with some of these if you want your residuals to stay solid. Basically, you can have most of the car's exterior elements in body colour or alternatively choose to trim some or all of them in either of three styles of exterior finish. And all three feature on this particular car. Gloss black, twill gloss carbon fibre and matte black. This car has the exterior black pack which gives you matte black window surround finishes and a matte black front grille mesh. There's a gloss black finish for the roof and the mirror caps and the side gills feature twill gloss black carbon while the exhaust pipes have matte black finishes. Nice. To a great extent, you can chop and change with these three styles of finish in many of the areas just mentioned, though there are some differences. If you don't like matte black for the front grille mesh, for instance, there are silver magnum or titanium options. The rear diffuser inserts can be matched to the exterior pack finish you've chosen. There's also a bespoke Q exterior graphics pack with some 
really bright colours and you can add a silver or a matte black underbonnet cross brace or a full engine cover in carbon fibre. Even the Aston Martin bonnet badge can be finished in carbon fibre. Best to talk it all through with your dealer. What about wheels? On the standard model, they're all 20 inches, but they come in a variety of forms. The standard silver Y-spoke rims can alternatively be ordered in gloss black diamond turned or graphite duotone finishes. Or, as here, you can have the rims with a forged finish. We've got forged textured black in this case. We could also have specified either silver or gloss black diamond turned finishes. Whatever your rim choice, you can add in your choice of brake caliper colour. Not only black as here and the usual red, grey, silver or yellow hues, but even blue or more vibrant vivid red or Madagascar orange finishes. What about getting the cabin exactly as you'd like it? Well, again, there are lots of options. The basic choice is between what Aston calls a monotone environment, which basically means predominantly black, and a duotone environment, which introduces contrasting grey panels onto the door cards and seat bolsters. There's a huge range of leather, colour and contrast stitching colour choices too. Inside here, we've got a contemporary colour interior with bespoke carpet finishing and contrast upholstery stitching. The headrests can be embroidered or embossed with either the Vantage logo, as here, or the Aston Martin winged badge. And the headlining can be finished in perforated leather, as here, or in Alcantara. In addition, there are various what Aston calls interior jewellery finishes for different parts of the cabin architecture. Here we've got the dark chrome package and we could also have had that mixed with the 2x2 two two twill satin carbon fibre finish that can also be used for the trim inlays. If you really want to make an extrovert statement to your passengers, other trim inlay options include painted finishes in either lime essence, hyper red or white stone. And you can have the seat belts finished in flint, champagne, spicy red, mocha or graphite if you don't like the usual black. Finishing touches include door sill tread plates in satin silver, dark chrome or 2x2 two two twill satin carbon fibre and colour keyed boot carpeting. Enough with options, what about Vantage safety provision? Well, as you'd expect, all the basics are in place. And Aston Martin is keen to stress that this car's bonded aluminium chassis is extremely strong. And of course, there are twin front, side and curtain airbags. Plus, tyre pressure monitoring and the usual electronic systems, including dynamic torque vectoring for extra cornering traction, ABS braking with emergency brake assist for panic stops, and a dynamic stability control setup with an interim setting that allows a little extra tail slip but will help you out in extremis. Unfortunately though, like some other makers in this sector of the market, Aston Martin chooses to make the sophisticated camera-driven safety features we're now well used to seeing on ordinary family cars, either optional, or the brand doesn't offer it at all. There's no autonomous braking setup available, for example, and blind spot monitoring costs extra. You can't have something as basic as lane departure warning. And even more bewilderingly, given the possibility that this car might sometimes be used for transcontinental grand touring, you can't specify adaptive cruise control either. You'd think auto dipping headlights would also be useful on a super sports car of this type. You don't get those either. As for any of the latest autonomous driving tech that presumably Aston Martin has access to through its partner Mercedes, well, that's lacking too, as is the option of a head-up display. Still, the brand reckons that Vantage buyers will have more important priorities than these, and they're probably right. If we tell you that this Vantage is vastly more efficient than its predecessor, that really isn't saying very much. That old car's CO2 emission figure hovered around 300 grams per kilometre, and though 20.4 mpg was claimed for a manual V8 variant on the combined cycle, the fairly frightening 14.2 mpg official urban cycle figure was more realistic barometer in terms of your likely returns. 
If you then fast forward into a world where a faster, more powerful Porsche 911 Turbo can these days manage 31 mpg on the combined cycle and 230 grams per kilometre of CO2, you realise the extent of the challenge that Aston Martin was facing here to bring the efficiency stats of this car at least within sensible realms. Especially given that this time round the Vantage has put on 20 kilos of extra weight. The adoption of a much more modern engine certainly helps. The Mercedes sourced 4 litre twin turbo unit featuring cylinder deactivation. You might be familiar with this kind of setup, one that on light to mid throttle loads cuts out half of the cylinder bank before restoring it seamlessly when extra acceleration is needed. As a result, the fuel and CO2 figures ascend beyond the level of embarrassment should you incur the wrath of green minded friends, though all the V8, Auto Coupe, and Roadster models still chug out a somewhat less than climate friendly 264 grams per kilometre of CO2. As for economy, well all the V8 Auto variants supposedly manage 24.3 mpg on the combined cycle, but you'll deserve some sort of award if you ever get near that, even on a long run. For the manual coupe model, the figures are 23.3 mpg and 276 grams per kilometre. Hard use will, of course, quickly see your petrol returns spiralling down towards single digits. At least a decently sized 73 litre fuel tank means a reasonable operating range. Expect about 300 miles on average. Overall, you'd think that you could hardly annoy Greenpeace more if you were to attach a whale harpooning gun to the bonnet. Yet, should you be inveigled into conversation with a bearded type, you could point out that in some ways this car is very green indeed. There's no wasteful recycling needed here because due to its build, no recycling's needed. There's nothing to rust and nothing to decay. Look after your Aston and it will still be thrilling people in 50 years time. What else? Well, insurance is predictably a top of the shop Group 50E, but better news comes with industry experts' expectation that residual values for this car will remain stronger than a rival Porsche 911 Turbo and Audi R8 V10 rivals. Servicing intervals are every year or every 10,000 miles, whichever comes first. Dealership visits, of course, won't be cheap, but there shouldn't be a need for unnecessary ones these days. The old Aston adage that customers could find out what was wrong, saving the brand a lot of development time, bother and expense, has thankfully long been abandoned. And these days, the asking price includes a three-year warranty and five years of maintenance too, including an efficient collection and delivery service or courtesy car use. Obviously, hard use will result in heavy brake and tyre wear. And on the subject of tyres, the bespoke Pirelli P0 rubber will be fearsomely expensive to replace. So bear that in mind before you go track day showboating. Without the Vantage, it's doubtful whether Aston Martin would be the company that it is today. Without this Vantage, it's doubtful whether the brand could ever achieve the goals it has for tomorrow. It isn't the junior GT sports car its predecessor was, so approach it expecting a scaled-down DB11 and you'll be in for a shock. For us, though, that's a good thing. At last, the company has produced a really engaging driver's car and a properly circuit-tuned machine. As others have pointed out, it isn't just an Aston that you might take on a track day. It's one you really must. This won't make it a perfect choice for Grand Touring, but that's fine. The British maker has other options if that's what you want. But is it better than a 911? No, it's different. And we like the Vantage for that. You may not. The slightly portlier weight means it's not quite as agile as the Porsche, and perhaps less significantly, it's thirstier and lacks the 911's useful rear seats. In compensation, though, a Vantage is more utterly exciting and will feel a more exotic thing to have in your driveway. Plus, you can drive and use this car as easily as you'd be able to in the Mercedes model it shares much of its engineering with. For many potential buyers, all these things will matter a lot.
Aston Martin has done a brilliant job in reinventing itself for the modern era, sourcing the right people and developing the right partnerships to put itself back at the cutting edge of sports car design. This vantage shows just how far the company's come. For us, it's the best thing that Aston makes, both in the way that it drives and the way that it looks. So it's nice that it's also the most affordable model in the company's range. Of course, affordability is a relative term when you're talking about a super sports car that'll probably cost you at least the best part of £130,000 or more when all said and done. Especially one that's brilliant but flawed. The bespoke interior, the muscular handling and the high running costs won't after all suit everybody, but for those seduced by Avantage, we think nothing else will do in this segment. There is, after all, something rather soulless about the clinical perfection of a rival Mercedes or Porsche that you just don't get here. And it's one of the reasons why you'll find Avantage simply overflowing with the kind of special feel you'll want in the sports car you've dreamed of owning all your life. More sophisticated than a Mercedes AMG GT, more exotic than a Porsche 911, it's brilliant and it's British. Enough said.